Hello, I am George. Um, thank you to Andy and Tom and the rest of the NDF crew for inviting me to come for a second time. Um, and to Raina for your smooth logistical planning and to the Auckland War Memorial Museum for supporting my journey here today. So, by way of introduction, this is a map of me. Um, I started my life in little old Adelaide in South Australia, where I was a bad student, uh, amongst other things. Um, and I fell into the web like a lot of other liberal arts folk uh, in the mid to late 90s. I was in Vancouver where Flickr was started. Had a great almost 10 years in San Francisco. Um, that's where the Flickr Commons came out of. Um, um, but I moved to London about a year ago to start my own company. It's called Good Form and Spectacle. And that URL at the bottom, um, you, might, you might like to take a note of because all the stuff I'm going to, all the projects I'll be talking about are there. So you can have a look later. So sit back and relax, uh, but not too much. I'm not afraid to point out sleeping people. I'm just going <laughs> to put that out there. So my current business plan is a little bit Robin Hoodie. Um, I specialize in making exploratory interfaces to large content collections. Um, so I'm working with big clients to try to do that kind of work. Uh, but I'm also trying to work hard to construct this company along um, three lines, one of which is uh, the big line, I want to be research and development. So far, the balance between R&D is about 60-40, and I'd love to try and keep it that way. I, I have a deep love of noodling on uh, about projects, and it's so important to have time to think um, and make things that no, have no commercial imperative. And it's ideal if one can lead back to the other and then back again. R&D to client to R&D to client. That's the sort of dynamic that I'm shooting at. And Melissa told us yesterday about the Innovation Lab here at Te Papa and Paula too about DX Lab in, in the State Library of New South Wales. And it's a great trend, I think, to give your people time to experiment on ideas that might, might be thrown away, actually, but also might make their way into, into public land. So the basic question I'm um, thinking about is what is museum practice? And today I'd like to talk to you about assumptions we make and attention we give and how thinking through articulation of our collections can prove useful. I'm mostly working on big interaction design projects um, for big content systems. And it's, it's my contention that we're still echoing the origins of Kunstkammern that emerged in the 16th century in our online experiences. Everything you've collected is displayed, and how much people can see online is proportional to your institutional status. And that's even after about 50 years of computing in the sector. But the good thing is, displaying everything at once is fertile ground for a designer like me, and you'll see that in a couple of our projects in a bit. Um, another dynamic I'm interested in is in a digital context, in a digital context, we're still looking for great ways to, to show curatorial or even just editorial depth at scale. And many interfaces to cultural collections today either force you to search or overwhelm you with explanation instead of just showing you the things and letting you explore. I liked what Claire told us this morning about free range learning. And while museums in particular are very good at facilitating this in the physical realm, I think we're still searching for it online. And I'd like you to carry with you um, for the next three hours or so um, a concept called the speed burden. And this was developed by a landscape designer and urbanist called Steve Muzon. This is um, overhead shots of old Florence and Atlanta today. And on the left, you see that Florence is designed for people and horses, and you must move slowly in the city. Uh, it's dense, the streets are tight, and cars, if they do drive there, they drive very slowly. But as the speed of vehicles increases, so does the need for space, basically to allow those vehicles to turn without having an accident. It's interesting to note that the Duomo, the Florence Duomo, sits inside that spaghetti bit in Atlanta, which isn't even in Atlanta, really. <coughs> but this concept feels like a nice metaphor to how we operate online today for me, particularly in the case of current design thinking around cultural catalogues. Search is the dominant paradigm, but I don't think that's how human operate, humans operate in a cultural context as their default. I think it's much more about wandering, and we're still not doing that well. 
as I said, museums are so good at helping people wander in the physical spaces, but we're just not there yet online. The other introductory idea is that openness and sharing and all that isn't really a new idea. And that's what it's been about since the great Kunstkammern of the 50, Kunstkammern days in the 1500s. Perhaps now, though, expectations have changed about what should be available to who and when and how. As we heard from Ben yesterday, the very nature of access is changing. So, so much that that word is losing its usefulness because there are so many new possibilities. This, is, uh, this hip cat is Roy Strong, uh, who was a very young director at the National Portrait Gallery and then the V&A in London. He's an interesting character who thinks well about what museums mean and even 40 years ago was advocating openness when he said, it's terribly important to get as much stuff out as possible. Um, as Andy mentioned, I was here in um, 2008 talking, or oh, in Auckland actually, excuse me, um, to talk about the Flickr Commons project, which was a fantastic stage in my life and my career. But I was happy to uh, take the chance to reflect a little bit on what I've seen change since then, and I'll come to you to speak about that. I think 2008 in particular, for me, was fascinating because I spoke to uh, hundreds of people working across the glam sector about the opportunity to join the maelstrom that was Flickr and all the sort of fears that that raised in them about um, control and authority and, and such and rights. Um, I very much enjoy a peripheral perspective across the glam sector, which I think is actually quite a luxury. I don't particularly specialise with one or the other, but I, I like having a, a glimpse into all. So, this is sort of the, the primary um, issues I heard in 2008. You know, we, we can't share that. Uh, we might make money. Um, but if we put this on the internet, we have to control everything everybody says about it. And I don't know if these things have actually totally gone away yet, but they're certainly transforming, and uh, that's super exciting. But if you fast forward to today, it is actually quite hard to come together with a list of assumptions. And I bet if I asked each of you what your assumptions were about that, you know, that have changed since then, I'd get 200 different answers. But these are a short list of assumptions that I'm poking at in my work. And they're the ones I find a bit contradictory and therefore a bit interesting. So the first two, are, I think, are sort of public expectations around interaction and availability. You know, everybody touches all the screens, and kids don't even, don't even call them touch screens anymore, do they? They're just screens. Um, and that expectation that we can get, find anything we want on the internet can be quite disappointing if you try to do, do that and you can't. Or you find what you want, but it's really small. Um, as a designer, lots of, uh, it's frustrating to me sometimes to hear people say in meetings about things, well, from a user point of view, I think blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think these, the numbers three and four are, smell a little bit like that. Um, this, this overriding assumption that people know what they look, they're looking for when they come to um, a collection is just really, really up for grabs. And I think actually the opposite is true in most cases. Um, but five and six are also fun, and I think they're a, they're a really nice push away from um, 2008, where you know make sure they steal our version and don't don't just steal some crappy version from somebody else. Um, but six, and I'll talk about this a little more. Um, the sense of outsourcing our authority, I think, has evolved even in the last sort of seven to ten years, where we use other services to maintain maintain and cleanse or st strengthen our metadata. But the, this is about a point four. This is only for researchers. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm lucky to, that I get to work across lots of different types of institutions. And it's surprising how often you hear defense of a crappy interface described as it's just for researchers. Um, when my godson, my godson turned five, I gave him a present. And it looked a little bit like this ruby. But it was so big, it hardly fitted in his hand. And it was from the v &A shop, which is a very good shop for Prezzies. But today, some seven years later, he has a huge rock collection, and he's really interested in ge geology. And I just got him the ruby because his name is Reuben, uh, but it blossomed into a research interest for him. So we need to stop saying this is just for researchers. You know, even, even researchers appreciate good design. <laughs> but apart from that, surely you also want to encourage uh, exploration by audiences who could become interested in further research, to encourage proto-researchers like Reuben. 
That's a bigger audience after all, isn't it? <clears throat> but yeah, this overwhelming prevalence of search as the default interface, I think, hampers exploratory and ex instinctual wandering. And that's something even researchers do, especially when they're at the beginning of forming questions to answer, or a bit stuck, or looking for new interconnections. And I wanted to pull this one out singly too, because it's, it's surprising to me. Um, it's especially prevalent in library land, I think, to pay sometimes quite exorbitant fees to external parties to either purchase metadata records or even to improve metadata using these external authority bodies. And we're seeing, uh, alongside that, increasing use of normal humans to perform metadata creation and cleanup tasks, which is good and should keep going. There's just a little niggle in my mind about using these big metadata clearing houses all the time, because in addition to propagating errors like a virus, it also gives away control. I asked the lead cataloger at a big library in London when was the last time she'd written an original catalogue record, and she couldn't remember. So make sure they steal our version. Um, this is also a really interesting change for me because it's an, an acknowledgement of the nature of the web and that people reuse and remix and steal stuff all the time. And the head of the Rice Museum um, in Amsterdam said, with, with the internet, it's so difficult to control your copyright or use of images that we decided we'd rather people use a very good high resolution image of Milkmaid from the Rice Museum rather than using a very bad reproduction. <coughs> this is um, a whistler. It's actually, um, the official copy is held at the Freer Sackler in DC. But um, Sarah Sturch has started a Tumblr that collects crappy reproductions and calls it um, art with an identity problem. <laughs> Isn't it? Uh, but another great thing, I mean, you know, look how much we can all see online now. It's really amazing, and I've, I've officially lost count of all the photos in the commons on Flickr, uh, or the number of institutions who've now put their metadata online or are sharing images. Um, all the number of things are in the millions and billions, and, and it's fantastic. These precedents are getting old now, and it's becoming normal. I mean, just look at that. <laughs> <laughs> It's nice to see they mowed the lawn back in uh, 1592. <laughs> <laughs> now that I've got your attention. <laughs> um, I've also been wondering about how human attention has changed in the last eight years, and I think it has a lot. You might be familiar with Linda Stone's theory of continuous partial attention. She's a writer and researcher who worked for Apple's, Apple for ages and then moved on to Microsoft Research. And she coined the phrase as early as 1998. And it's the idea that we all work on a variety of little things at once. Deep dives are difficult. And I know I struggle to read long things on the web and even on paper these days, to my detriment, I'm sure. But we give our attention to lots of things, even if it's in little bits, and lots of us do. Like Facebook reporting that a billion users in a single day use the service back in August. That's about one in seven of us, which is nuts. But here's the crazy part. As this article from February this year said, loads of people who use Facebook don't even realize they're using the internet, or that there's more to see than Facebook itself. So I hope you've all got your Facebook pages all, all set. Um, we're also giving our attention to people like this. He's a cute Swedish guy, and he goes by the moniker PewDiePie. Does anyone know PewDiePie? Yes. <laughs> he makes rude, inane, funny videos on the web, often about narrating gameplay and making the players do stupid, weird stuff, like bashing each other with shopping trolleys. I thought about playing you a video, but there's more inanity and swearing than even I'm comfortable to put on stage. But he's funny and cute, so there's that. And he's got 40 million people listening to him. I've been, as research, of course, I've been following Kim Kardashian <laughs> on Instagram with about 46 million of my fellow humans for the past month or so, and I think it's making me dumber. <laughs> I'll be stopping the basic research after the conference. But 46 million humans t tune into her photo stream for a moment here, a moment there, and she's carved a brand and manipulated this intimate medium of Instagram to make her watchers feel like they're her friend. And then you see pictures like this, and I, 
I don't know if irony is quite the right word, but I just love the way that somebody thought they needed to highlight the old lady who's not using her phone. I wish I had the Photoshop mad skills to remove the red thing to see if you guys would notice that, you know, she stands out like a sore thumb. This is what I mean. We're sort of, the attention's a bit weird. It's sort of making us dumber because we have to look at all this stuff all the time, I think. I could be wrong. Please talk to me afterwards over a beer about that. Tell me how wrong I am. This is a photo taken just before the new iPhone came out last month. And it's mostly lots of men queuing in line asleep or almost asleep to buy as many iPhones as they can afford. And it's really weird how Apple, the company, has entirely captured our attention. <laughs> uh, when I lived in San Francisco, just about everyone I know would drop everything to watch whatever keynote was happening. Mac lovers have all been trained, including me, to buy their expensive shit and make Apple one of the most valuable companies on the planet. So they have captivated us. And yet, our attention often looks like this. Uh, and this is a photo by my friend, Timo Arnold. He's been documenting and studying people looking at their phones for about 10 years. It's interesting to sort of see the size of the phones get smaller and then bigger again, <laughs> glowing in different ways. But it's well worth a look, and they're great subjects because they don't know that you're looking at them. Their attention's fixed, and even though it might be on a bunch of distributed tasks, as in uh, Stone's theory, um, they're still kind of busy. And even though we're all tethered to our devices again, they're also incredible human things happening at a huge scale. And there are bazillion examples of this, but this one, personally, I find uh, moving and important. Uh, on the 14th of April last year, 276 schoolgirls were kidnapped by Boko Haram terrorists in Nigeria. 57 escaped and 219, or, or approximately, are still missing. This is a photo of girls at a nearby school um, showing their support and love. And it happened all over the internet. I, I was involved. Um, I hope that some of you were too. Um, it even got to the White House. And this, to me, feels like some kind of renewed humanism. And I'm definitely not a Renaissance scholar, but new reflection and study of humanism was central to the first Renaissance. Back then, people were reading sort of classical um, Greek texts and so forth. But now, it feels to me like we're seeing each other instead. And uh, just like Tim told us yesterday, uh, I just saw a person, and there's power in that. But Attention feels a little bit like this as well. This is a crazy project called the Sky Ladder, um, where artist Kai Guang Kang um, ignited this firework ladder. And addition, in addition to looking lovely as it rose over the sunset, it was a birthday present for his 100-year-old grandma. But just the way it looks, you know, humans moving up to support. Um, add a tick to a, a cause or um, a nod to a person. That's, that's different. I could just watch this for hours, but we could just loop it. Or I could just move on. <laughs> but in terms of attention and cultural materials, you know, I, as I said, this, this man's one of my favourite artists, and when I saw the ladder, I, I poked deeper around on the web to see what other kind of work that he had online and discovered he'd done some kind of residency at the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA. And I found this great video, it's just too, too fun not to share. Favourite medium is fireworks, you know? So cool. It's going to be loud.
Isn't that great? You'll have to look and find the work yourselves. Haha. <laughs> ha. <laughs> um, I only realise, as I, at the very end of writing this um, presentation, that I've incorporated a bunch of art as conceptual hooks in the talk, and I, I've really enjoyed that. Uh, I think there's a huge swathe of artists who've responded to what I think is the collision of humans and computing, uh, or at least I think so, uh, and I've referenced them in some of, in the talk today. Um, like this work, which is uh, by Japanese artist Yayoi Kusama. And it was first installed in the Queensland Gallery of Modern Art in 2002, and since then has been repeated um, at the Tate and then uh, back in um, uh, Queensland. And the work begins as a completely white room, and it's gradually covered in brightly colored dots that are to the artist's specification over the course of, say, two weeks or so. And to me, this feels a little bit like crowdsourcing, or the, the strength of crowdsourcing. Um, I liked Ben's point yesterday about casual effort versus expert input. And you know, even though theorists like Clay Shirky says we should be making systems where anyone can contribute any amount, I'm still curious to hear much more about the results of public participation, particularly in terms of metadata enhancement finding its way into official catalogues or actual intellectual depth or advancement. I think it's interesting that Kusama is one of the world's so-called pop most popular artists, and she makes work like this where normal humans affect its outcome. Um, this is a very recent article. It just came out a couple of days ago. Uh, it's about MoMA in New York beginning to host monthly Wikipedia editathons, and it's a great endorsement of the platform, but it's also a clever and gentle kind of shepherding by the museum towards better articles about the things they know about, and this is good. Um, and there was an interesting comment at the bottom of the article by a Wade Harshman, I kid you not, Harshman. He said, uh, I'm glad to see MoMA is also maintaining possession of its own web page and information authority. This is, after all, what the Wikipedia pages will rely on. Far too many organizations are surrendering their proprietary footprints on the web. I don't really have a comment, I just thought it was funny. <laughs> uh, but you know, in terms of attention, um, I like watching how people can move in museums. I, I, it feels often ponderous. But it can also be super fast. Um, and it, but it's not like search. Um, I'm doing a, bit, a little job for the British Museum at the moment, and I sat in the same spot in a small room that housed a single collection. And I witnessed two young women stride into the space, completely miss the super important holy thorn reliquary containing a thorn that might have pierced Jesus' brow, and they whipped out their phones in tandem and took a photo, a simultaneous photo of the first shiny thing they saw, <laughs> which is a big gold thing right in the center of the case. Um, before they'd even finished taking the shot, they'd already, their eyes had already moved away from it as they scanned the room for the next shiny thing to take a picture of. And it was weird and funny, but I just, you know, the people who arranged the gallery thought so long and hard about isolating this very, very important reliquary, you know, but the girls just completely missed it. <laughs> Sorry, it's not funny. <laughs> um, so this is Barbara Hepworth. Uh, she's a famous British sculptor. And apart from her work being lovely, it's often designed to be outside in a particular place. And I like the way she thinks about interaction with her work. She says, sculpture communicates an immediate sense of life. You can feel the pulse of it, but it's perceived above all by the sense of touch, which is our earliest sensation. And then you see her exhibited at the Tate. And this reviewer said it best, I think, when he said, at its best, Hepworth's work is like an invigorating walk by the sea. What a shame, then, that Tate has trapped her sculptures in airless vitrines. So it, it comes back to the, uh, that idea of search versus wonder for me. And these are just a couple of rough sketches I made as I prepared the talk, where the top left um, illustration is this pervasive paradigm for using cultural stuff online where it's search, retrieve, go back, try again type of thing. But the recognition of and designed for things that are part of a network is much more native to the web and a method that I think humans handle well. So it's sort of 
instinct versus speed or something like that. Uh, I've also been visiting as many small museums as possible in my new life in London. And this is Mr. Penicillin, Kevin Brown. Uh, he works at Alexander Fleming Laboratory in, uh, Museum in London. And uh, it's a wonderful museum. It's actually stationed within a working hospital. And you have to sort of move past ablution rooms where men are washing themselves. And then you go upstairs and ring a bell and Kevin clatters down and then takes you up to Alexander Fleming's actual laboratory. And then he opens the gate and steps through it and then closes it. <laughs> and then he's at Alexander Fleming's desk and he pretends to take a little swab of your hand and then he turns around and then turns back around with the, Petri, the famous Petri dish with the <laughs> bacteria moving away from the... Um, um, or whatever the hell the science was. Anyway... <laughs> I mean, look at this guy. You can't beat... I mean, I don't know how to do that kind of experience online. You certainly... Uh, it's bloody hard. But, you know, that's, that's the sort of thing that I think we should aspire to. So, you know, well, the one thing that Web 2.0 gave us, I think, was live data on web pages, live things that changed and moved. And what we need is sort of recognition and literacy and comprehension of that in the cultural context. And I think we're still sort of searching for the transformations that move us from information to experience and knowing to feeling and things to stories. So now I'd like to share a little bit of work that my firm's been making this year. And broadly speaking, I've been exploring the, this idea of articulation. So there's one kind of articulation which is about good pronunciation and how well you can say the sounds that make words. And articulation and speech therapists work along this kind of spectrum from isolation to conversation or competence to mastery. And I wonder where we are in this kind of spectrum in terms of digital collections and their articulation. And not much further than syllables or words, I think. But again, this predominant search mechanism feels very similar to being able to isolate a phoneme like p or b. But there's another kind of articulation which relates to adding features or joints to a body so it can move in more directions. And I like this too as a device to think with in terms of moving through a cultural collection. How many pivots can we give our objects to interconnect it with other concepts in our collections? I mean, how can you articulate your collections instead of seeing a list of search results in isolation? And now I have to show you another awesome thing I found on the internet. As I was researching the idea of articulation, I came across this weird-ass speech robot that was too weird not to share. And it comes out of a lab in, in Japan who's actually making a machine that practices this articulation. And it represents to me where we are, uh, basic and obvious. Uh... In a digital space, you know, this, this act of exploring still feels like we're looking around cabinets like this. It still feels like loads of stuff in boxes or shelves, stuff in isolation. What a great opportunity. So yeah, um, we were exploring this kind of dynamic. And I don't know where I got the phrase fat head from, but I couldn't work out what the name is for the top of the long tail. Is that the arse gap? <laughs> anyway. How do we represent curatorial depth or editorial strength at scale across a big catalog? That's the question for me. So this is a project we made using the V&A Museum catalog. Um, I got given it on a USB stick by my friend Andrew, who works there. And um, it's, it's called the V&A Spelunker. That's easier to search for that than type in a giant URL. A spelunker is an American word for cave diving. 
And I kind of like that as a metaphor for sort of poking around dark corners and, you know, you may or may not die in the slippery wet stuff. Um, so one of the key concepts of this first exploration was about showing everything, just drawing everything in the database. So it, we made a, what is a blunt tool for exploring this stuff. This is the home page. It just shows you random set of nine things that are, have the same type. And even that typological sort of setting is good. Um, you could just hit again, again, again if you want to see more, and it just reloads another set of stuff of a different type. Um, don't underestimate the value and usefulness of a good old ranked list. Um, we find that a very, very easy um, first cut way to get a sense of the structure of the collection and the scope of it. Then we just drew out every record and made stuff links where it made sense, just so we can move around in it and sort of start, you know, exploring. And then for each type, we would just draw out everything that returned in that result. And you'll notice there's zero metadata. Some things don't have images, um, but that just means they basically get ignored in this sort of visual exploration. So digitize as much as you can. <laughs> the other idea that we started to, we cracked open in this project was this sort of sense of a catalog as a landscape. You know, if we, I, I encourage you to accept the challenge of removing the search box from your websites and seeing what happens. You know, um, I think it's a great gentle pressure on you to figure out the peaks and troughs and landmarks and, and aspects of your collection that you can show to people to help them navigate it. People don't know necessarily what they're looking for when they come to you or what you've got, so you need to present them with a landscape. But this is a very simple visualization that only takes in a few date inputs. Um, on the, on the left-hand side, the, there's a row for each object, and you're looking at a date range between 1700 and 1800. There's a row for each date range, and we just mapped the date create range, which gets more, um, you know, specific if it's stuff like coins, but often as a range. And alongside that, we uh, mapped when the things were acquired. And that's it. Um, sometimes, um, there was stuff, there were patterns that you can just see straight off the bat like that, and some, you know, they'd be bo a, a box of uh, clay fragments from Rome or something. Sometimes the museum isn't sure when it acquired things, which is also, I think, a really interesting sh thing to be able to show to the staff who maintain the data, because I think that can be a very c simple pointer to areas in the catalogue that might need some um, attention in terms of co data quality. But it was really fun to show the staff this, and actually that's become a bit of a theme in the work, is working with the, the data creators themselves and showing them pictures like this and having them um, respond was really good. Um, this is Grayson Perry, who's a British Turner Prize winning artist, and he made a brilliant exhibition at the British Museum called The Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman. Uh, as well as showing objects from the BM collection, he made several pieces himself, including this tapestry that you see behind him. And his work is, um, is couched in sort of traditional techniques like ceramics or metalwork or tapestry. Um, and it's beautiful and slowly made. Uh, but it's also, um, he thinks interestingly about the art world and he's well worth a look. Uh, he's written tons of books and stuff. But in the catalog for that particular exhibition, he said, the relationship between my personal themes and obsessions and the vastness of world culture as represented by the British Museum is like a narrow pilgrimage trail across an infinite plain. So it, that, that opens up this idea nicely, I think, of search versus wander and wayfinding versus, you know, being told. And, you know, what are the paths and, and nodes in your collection that you can show people to help them find their way? How could we create an image of a catalogue? Um, this is a, another project that we did. It was called Two Way Street, and it was a, a guerrilla project actually that we made using British Museum catalogue. Um, and it, uh, I did it with Tom Armitage and Frankie Roberto, and it took us about four days to build once we'd done a bunch of data wrangling, which took much longer than that. Um, it's a it's what, what's sort of known as a generous interface. It's a term that popped out of Australia, which I really like. Um, but it's attempting this kind of scalable editorial point of view. And it's the editorial point of view is about the acquisition history of the collection. 
um, and the British Museum in particular is a sort of you know height of imperialism. So I, I'm, I've become really interested in how the museum came to form, and it's not necessarily something that's talked about very much. So I wanted to just peel that away. So we've used. Um, visualization here quite surgically, um, and I'll just explain a couple of the techniques. So this is actually a map of the whole collection of some two million records that we've, we downloaded as RDF. Um, we jettisoned all the RDF, actually, sorry RDF people, and just took one field out of it, which was just simple key value pairs. And some of those key value pairs were about the date that things were acquired. So this is decades since the museum opened, from 1751 to today. And they're shaded based on the number of objects that were acquired in that decade. And I didn't know, but uh, the BM actually acquired most of its things in the 80s, um, including an enormous currency collection from a UK govern government department. And you know how all those coins fill up your collections. But just to compare it, the second chart is filtered to show us only the acquisition pattern for uh, 988 objects from the Venetian school that the British Museum has or the 85,000 or so things uh, with the subject classical deity. And interesting, that, that seems to be a fairly consistently popular subject. Uh, but we can also, for each filtered chart like this, we can also show who the things were acquired from. So this is showing the top three, either individuals or organizations that the stuff came from. And there's just loads of stories in that, that information, you know, who collectors were, what they were collecting, and when they were collecting it, and when they chose to give it to the museum. Sometimes they're the artists, but other times they're wealthy people who travel too much and buy stuff or whatever. But yeah, and this is the data. That's the guts of, guts of how we made it. Um, there's also another quite subtle visualization here where you can see the darkness of the text relates to how many records in the, that record set have values for those attributes. So for example, you can see type of thing is often, um, often has a value. But it's a very simple data structure, and we just made this crazy explorer, um, and again, with no search box. <clears throat> so this is an example of a facet view. It's called, this is all the stuff that was made, found in somewhere. Um, so the most things were found in Egypt, some 40, 41,000 things. Um, some things were found in question mark, <laughs> which is really interesting. And that's actually one, two, three, four, five, six. The sixth most found in place was question mark. Um, and again, I'm curious about how these sorts of visual interfaces can, can show the data owners where, uh, about, teach them about their own catalogue, and that's, that's definitely an emerging theme in this kind of, in this kind of stuff. Uh, but I looked at um, Iraq, comma, South, and straight away I'm just looking at stuff that was found in Iraq, comma, South. Um, we introduced a second visualisation which also reacts to the list of stuff that it's displaying. It's sort of like facets, but we, we chose to represent it visually because it's a good way to, you know, these sort of spots tell you proportions of types of things that make up this group of objects. So in this case, you can tell at a glance that most of the things from South, South Iraq came in, in the collection is clay tablets, and about a quarter of it was acquired in 1883. So again, for comparison, this is, um, this is another set, just so you can see how it changes. And again, all of these are linked, so you can just be bouncing or spelunking or tumbling your way around. And your eyes will show you words, you know, you, you click on words that you're interested in. It's a very instinctual and fun way to browse. There's also things from New Zealand, um, mostly carved or on paper, some badges and some things about body ornamentation. Does anyone know who Susan St. Lawrence is? Is she famous? Nope. And yeah, but before I know it, I've traveled from Iraq to New Zealand, and, and it's great. Um, and I, I was absolutely stoked beyond belief to see that the staff from within the British Museum began to use Two Way Street. And this is um, Details Details is a curator in the prints and drawings department called Isabel. And I've now met her through um, her use of this thing. And I'm, I'm just loving that these kinds of tools can be useful to staff who operate with the collections every day. And she said she found stuff that she didn't even know she had. So it's this idea of an externally produced digital reflection on your catalog, I think, that's, that's intriguing. And this is hopefully the sort of use that um, the linked open data project we saw from the Auckland uh, War Memorial Museum can encourage. Excuse me. 
And then I got a client, which was super exciting. <laughs> um, and it was the Wellcome Library. This is Sir Henry Wellcome, uh, who was a, an American British pharmaceutical entrepreneur. Um, he made tons of money because he patented m taking medicine in a tablet form called a tabloid. He left a large amount of his capital for charitable work in his will, and that was used to form the Wellcome Trust. Um, he was also a keen collector of medical artifacts, and that's led to one of the world's best collections about medicine. But so the project we did with Wellcome was basically just a four-week crash-through type of um, um, project where we literally just split the, the month of work together into these sort of four types of things. And these were basically just, that, that formed the brief from the client and we were just paid to be on site at the institution and work with the teams directly, making as much software as we could in a short amount of time. And you can um, study this at your leisure later at whatsinthelibrary.com. Um, but we were very clear with both the client and the general public that this is all experimental. And actually, I had it written in at the contractual level that this wasn't production strength code and shouldn't be taken as such. It was about sketching in code and just seeing what we could make together. Um, it was exciting that Jen and her team at Wellcome was open and excited about that kind of work. And we all just sort of looked at each other one day and agreed uh, together that it was a good thing to try also to make the work public. So we actually announced the blog, I think it was at the beginning of the second week of the project. So as I said, you can have a, a poke at this at your leisure, including the sort of 60 or so blog posts we, we wrote as we worked on it. So week one was all about scope. And um, we got a, a dump of Mark XML and tried to figure out its size and shape uh, quite naively. Um, Frankie Roberto and Tom Stewart, who I worked on the project with, didn't know anything about Mark, um, and I know enough to be dangerous, and certainly enough to encourage them not to learn anything about Mark, <laughs> but to try to keep it as abstract as we could. So we just did sort of naive things like total counts of stuff, and you'd be surprised how many institutions don't look at these kinds of numbers about their data. And in fact, we were the first people to reveal the actual amount of digitized objects in the Wellcome Library collection, which I just find kind of strange. Um, this is another one of those um, drawings of the whole collection. So this is um, a summary of all the fields in Mark that's used across the collection. And even though there's something like a thousand plus Mark fields available to librarians, um, Wellcome only actually uses a maximum of 180. And you can see there that we've shaded the ones they use often darkly so that you can see, actually, it's fairly sparse, which is, opens an interesting question about you know, the format they're using and whether they're using it to the, the, its fullest extent. But again, it's a blunt, blunt tool to sort of show us data coverage or this, poking at this idea of quality of data. Um, and then we just, again, we were just drawing everything. So this is a, just a, the same sort of data, but represented slightly differently. So you can see the, the top most used, used fields here. That, um, there are only four fields in the system that we use 100% of the time. And it's a real um, sh uh, drop off to a long tail. Um, we did, we were sort of map distributions within the mark fields themselves. Um, so you can see, a quite heterogeneous fields down the bottom. I forget what field that actually was, but it's one that doesn't need um, you know, groupings in it. Uh, but language code at the top, you can see that most of the stuff is written in English, for example. And all these were interactive, so you could move your mouse over and see the value that were, was in the mark field. And it's just a really nice way to start sort of moving around. Then we went one step deeper, and you can see we've repeated that idea of drawing the whole catalog in mark, and just now we've printed it out so there's a row for every record. And I was sort of secretly hoping this might reveal to us different humans um, or different practices in the catalogue. And you see the, there's black and blue lines there, and the blue lines were the, are records written by archivists, and the black one um, are library records. But yeah, you can see we've just used that sort of key there um, to help people try to understand what's going on. And also we're just printing out simple values for things like total numbers of records or percentage of um, records across the collection that have a value in this field. And then we're just, it's kind of fun to use um, hyperlinked mark records. 
as a really sort of dumb way to look around. But it's all about links, lots and lots of links. So that was week one. We just drew everything. Then week two was about showing the thing. Um, so many searches are so frustrating on the, on the web because you don't have to, the image straight off the bat or you have to click three times or then a fourth one to get a big one or this kind of thing. Uh, but this is a tree graph of um, types of stuff in uh, Welcome Library's art collection, which I didn't know they had, but they've got an amazing iconographic collection of artworks that have medical themes in them. So they've got stuff like a Rembrandt where he's you know, checking his reflexes or something. But then you sort it by the number of things that are digitised and you get a totally different view. And this is a big group of AIDS posters that they've done a great job of digitising. But again, and you're just looking at everything. We had another little surgical um, visualisation here which just shows the proportion of records that have been digitised. And again, that graph changes with any view that you're looking at, so it's just a quick visual cue. And the design on the right is mine and the design on the left is theirs. I just wanted to draw your attention to the real estate that the image <laughs> takes up in those two designs. So just make everything bigger, okay? <laughs> just do that, like tomorrow, because everybody will love you. Um, then we had a really sort of handmade content and context creation week. So we were, um, I think four, three or four of us spent the whole five days building content about this guy. Um, James Gilray was a caricaturist and printmaker who was born in 1756 and witnessed the sort of birth of medicine in London and all the, he was particularly scathing of the quackery and politics of the period that surrounded that. But we ended up with this giant web page, um, which we just built by hand. And um, we structured the investigation around, tell us about the thing itself, Tell us how that relates to themes about the things and how that pokes into the rest of the collection and then even further out into the rest of the web. And we ended up with a really fun and good and informative bunch of stuff. I mean, it took a while to build, but that was the first time and maybe it'll be faster next time. And I learned a lot about Gilray and, it was, and printmaking actually in London in uh, the, the late 1700s. But um, we also wrote all the copy, and I could just see um, Lolita, who is the content editor at Welcome, just kind of holding on really tight as we said stuff like, um, you know, look, you can see Jenna in the print below injecting pus into a sceptical woman surrounded by cow humans. <laughs> <laughs> but we inserted tools from other systems too, like the Google Ngram viewer, where we compared in this example um, the, the um, emergence of the word vaccination and the decline of the word smallpox. And it's interesting to see how that happened so, um, so bluntly at the, um, around 1800, which I've highlighted for you handily. And then again, manually, we just looked out onto the rest of the internet to find stuff about Gilray. So we had this giant list. I don't know if you can see the, whoops. Let's see the giant list on the, on the right-hand side there of about, I don't know, 20 or so international resources about it. And that just cracked open a quick question for me about um, um, can objects themselves be internetually curious? Can they listen on the internet uh, to see what people are saying about them? Um, I'm just going to do a quick time check. And I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because there's a project that I really want to talk about. Um, and you can go and look at this yourself. Please do. So this is week four, where we sort of tried to bring the whole idea together. And we integrated with Wikipedia to pull in um, images of all the people who were involved in the collection. And it was nice to turn those people into characters like this because uh, you can just perceive approximately when they might have been operating because of their imagery. Simple visualization about publishing history of apparent death, which is one of those corker subjects you only get a welcome. And we made this fun little thing to hang in the lifts at the library itself. It was just a little flyer, just to, you know, with those tear off things at the end. And that was a really nice way to just get it out into the building. And, you know, that's something I've definitely noticed is that you guys aren't very good at talking to each other with under the same roof. So stuff like this is just a fun way to do it. And in all of our projects, so the v and Spelunker, a Netflix thing we did, the British Museum, we've also created a RESTful JSON API as a byproduct of our work. So any of the URLs or any of the pages that I've showed you already, you can just hit it and grab JSON. 
And we sort of, <laughs> we just didn't, did that without really asking and they don't seem to mind, so it's all good. And I have to say that this kind of interface is a bit more um, digestible to many more developers than processing some massive RDF lump that's completely indigestible. Um, I'm doing a project for the British Museum right now, which is super cool, but I'll skip ahead of it. It's um, a super um, classic collection of gilded and crafted things, um, but I'm trying to apply the same idea about showing everything and spelunking to it. And I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of very simple articulated angles on these objects that you might like to try, like how big it is kind of drawn for you, and even just where it is located in the, in the gallery space itself. And we ha we're having some fun comparing these really rich gilded objects with the tennis balls <laughs> as this kind of scale um, object. But we're also going to release um, this little tool to draw three-dimensional things. We're planning to release that so you guys can use it too. So if you have dimensions in your database, you can draw shapes like this. Okay. I've got 10 minutes to go, so I have to race a little bit through this project, which is um, the, a major R&D project for the company. We're looking for a premises in London right now to establish this thing called the Small Museum. And the reason is because uh, even though it's a rubbery figure, something like 80% of glams across the planet have less than 10 staff. Is there anyone here who has such a small institution? Yes? Cool. You guys are the best. Um, but this is, um, this, these guys aren't the people who get big content management systems built for them or collections management software or sometimes they don't even have computers or they're wholly volunteer led and that's a space that I want to try to move into and see what I can do to help. So the plan for the research project is to follow along with the chapters in um, UNESCO's handy running a museum handbook that came out in 2004. Um, and it was actually created to sort of safeguard the cultural heritage of Iraq. Um, but I've noted the chapter headings on all my notebooks, um, and I'm just using this plan to sort of study, or begin to study the museum as a subject, and the museum as a medium, and the museum as a technology, and to see if I can um, help uh, create new skills and methods and techniques for the little guys. So we did this really fun, um, I guess it was a pop-up, at this really fancy building in London called Somerset House. And we were this, just this scrappy bunch. Um, this is my team, uh, Tom Flynn and Harriet Maxwell, who worked for about 10 days with me. Super fun. They both recovered museum professionals. Um, this, is my, this is the collection. Um, it was a, a 10 3D models from the British Museum, and they were selected just because they were available, but they were also geographically distributed, uh, uh, which was nice. This is the museum, the table that you see there. We started calling the tabletop the museum, because literally that's where everything happened. Each day we would pull off whatever we'd done the day before and stick a new museum on the table. And here's an example of a space where you can see one of the displays we made. But 10 days and 10 objects, and we sort of aligned um, a day with an object as we explored. So this is day one. We were, we were getting to know our new collection. And we worked out where they were all made, uh, when they were all made, and when they were all acquired by the museum, the British Museum. This is a, an actualization of their geographic distribution. Uh, but yeah, each day we picked an object of focus, and this is Hoa Hakananaya, and uh, he's from Easter Island, and we mapped his journey from Easter Island into the British Museum, and we used, um, you can see the pink circle down there, we used um, an audio recording of, an actual audio recording off the coast of Easter Island, so if you placed him in the circle, you would hear the sound of Easter Island, and then Tom made a recording of his new home in the British Museum, which is sort of, you know, security announcements and hubbubs and, you know, school kids laughing and stuff. And if you moved him into that zone, you would hear that. It was quite sweet. But an interesting side fact, he was actually acquired by the museum on the same day as the Rosetta Stone. So that was a bumper crop. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, this actually, this project was thinking of things that way, you know, their actual path from their home to the British Museum really got us thinking about the two-way street project and gave us that sort of editorial um, slant. 
So we actually did this project before Two Way Street, so I apologise if that was confusing. But this is day four. This is Nandi. Um, he's a steed of Shiva, and Nandi sits outside temples to Shiva, and in real life, he's surrounded by energy and people and prayers and flame and food and powder and flowers. But in the museum, he's stuck in this cold blue corridor, and he's solitary and completely out of context. And we really wanted to sort of pay attention to that. So on day four, we made this piece, um, and we got a video here to show. It's mostly blue for some. And then each day we would hang up yesterday um, in, the, in the room that we had, and that actually became a really nice display to explain to new visitors just what the hell we were doing. <laughs> um, but that's day one on the right, two, three, four. And there's uh, Nandi. Um, but I think it was, as I said, this, the story behind the Ramesses II um, model that cemented my interest in revealing that acquisition history at the British Museum um, and, and led to that editorial stance that we took on Two Way Street because this guy, Henry Salt, um, he was the British Consul General to Egypt for a short while. And at that time, he, he brought um, over 1,500 things from Egypt and sold them at auction to the British Museum and took the money himself. Um, and I just find that really weird. And uh, so we just printed out about a hundred of the things that he brought in and just sprayed them all over the place and put some fairly fiery language below that, uh, the fold there that was talking about stealing things and stuff. So, but people really responded very, very well uh, to that kind of um, ability to speak directly to the creators of the museum. And it was really interesting how we got to witness as we called ourselves museum, even though we were just a bunch of volunteers, you know, making stuff in a room, using that word museum uh, calmed people as they entered. You know, as, as, soon as, we, as soon as we said, oh, we're a museum, they're like, oh, you know, okay, well, show me what you got, kind of thing. Um, but they also got us to, got to see us working in public. And there's just a couple more experiments I wanted to show because they're super fun. Um, I knew I wanted to do some experimenting with Internet of Things. And um, the voiceover you'll hear, the English gent, um, was actually made by a, a chap who just popped in, but he had a really nice voice, so I got him to read some labels for me. And other statues were reused in the nearby mortuary temple. But we stuck an chap. NFC chip on the bottom of each of the objects, and then we used this little reader thing. The Rosetta Stone, translation of the demotic text, year nine, Zandikas day four, which is equivalent to the Egyptian month, second month of Peret, day 80. Colossal foot, Roman, first to second century AD. Right foot That's wearing Jeff. Greek sandal. And uh, this, this experiment I think is kind of interesting because it's about, just like we did with Nandi, where you lifted Nandi off uh, his label to reveal his actual life. Um, in this piece, we're using the Rosetta Stone, as you'll see. I think we'll just do it just so it's... All right, you ready? Everyone ready? Mm -hmm. Sorry about the jerkiness. It is agreed that a festival shall be kept in the temples throughout Egypt on these days in every month. So you get the idea. As you position an object in space, it, it uh, makes the content react in a different way. I mean, I guess it would be ideal if you could actually speak into the Rosetta Stone and have it say something, but... Um, and what you might not know is that the text of the Rosetta is actually really boring. Um, so don't worry about reading it. But the last experiment, on the, on the very last day, we did a very quick augmented reality experiment with this colossal foot. And this proved to be a crowd favourite, um, which was really interesting. It was very, very simple. We used a piece of software called Augment, um, free and easy to use. But I wanted to show you because it's one of my favorites. 
It's only quick. So this is me and Tom. So you have to scan this kind of reference image to, to give it a spot to project onto. How big is it? <laughs> really big. Okay, so you got it. Yeah. So now if I pick this thing up, it'll move. Yep. Uh, if I if I hold this. Oh my god. And then. <laughs> Obviously a giant yourself. bunch of amateurs at this point, but. Oh, I've got my finger over the camera. That's not good. Is it nine? The model's still there, but it's kind of not attached to the. <laughs> if you move that up and down, does it move? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Now, if you put it on, like flat, like you're reholding it. <laughs> really hard. And then turn it around. So that's like, the actual uh, size, obviously, yeah, of the colossal yeah, foot. Is it kicking me in the face? Ah, oh, this is very, very gently funny. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> anyway, fun. We also had some kitty visitors as well. This is Arthur and Henry Maxwell, Harriet's boys. They took like ducks to water like, to these objects and just immediately started asking about them and playing with them and arranging them. And the next day, Harriet, their mum, brought in a museum in a box that they'd made overnight. It's the Arthur and Henry Maxwell bequest, the first bequest to the small museum. But then I thought, oh shit, we're gonna be a museum of museums in boxes. But that was incredibly sweet. But yeah, um, so the small museum, uh, please, please stay in touch. Um, this is a map of visitors. We had 159 visitors over the course of 10 days. And the pink dots there are people who came back, which is really nice. Like once they worked out that it's gonna be different every day, they came back. And um, we had a visitor's book, of course, and I'll be probably putting this in every presentation I ever do from now on. <laughs> but you know, how does the museum, despite its best efforts to create certainty, produce unpredictability? Well, through fragmentation, aggregation, selection, juxtaposition, connection, contrast, excess, and confusion. Uh, this is a from a paper called Museum as, Uto uh, as Utopian Thought, which um, I can link to later, from an academic I like from New York City called Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, but I'll put a link in, in Twitter later. So to end off, uh, time's up, so I'll, I'll be quick. Um, so Good Form and Spectacle was still in the sort of pretty early deconstruction phase, and it might be some time, for some time, or it might be forever, I don't know. Um, but the point is we're trying to use really dumb tools bluntly, and that's a phrase from this artist who's called Lucas Blaylock, who does really fun stuff with Photoshop, you know, airbrushing and that kind of stuff. This isn't actually a sneaker, if you look closely. But to use dumb tools bluntly to explore this museum space. And uh, as somebody in the army once said, um, if I hit something, I'll call it the target. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>